are ethnic groups in this country that are rich simply because African people support them and do not support their own businesses or don't support the efforts to open businesses and establish financial institutions. This was part of the catalyst behind the 1970 Black Power Revolution, for example, when people of African descent could not get loans in banks and couldn't even get jobs in banks. Professor Selwyn Ryan, within the last 10 years, did research showing that there's still a bias in that that is connected to the early days of emancipation where they passed laws such as the habitual idlers ordinance, the master servants ordinance, restriction of African people owning land because they wanted us to be workers on plantations. So that template of us being a vote bank for political parties that empower non-African ethnic groups, regardless of the ethnicity base of those political parties, and also the business arrangement, it is identical in almost every Western society that we go to. So we don't have any problem or issue with persons of other races and their operations. That's understood that anyone would naturally pursue whatever success is available for them. But we have to come to some kind of realization that if we look inward and seek to empower ourselves through simply getting up, then we have liberation in our own hands. Take, for example, the poorest part of Port of Spain. If 1,000 poor people grow $1,000 worth of food in one year, that is $1 million in that community in added food security. That is also $1 million less in petty street crimes, robberies, and even drug abuse and drug addiction. And that self-independence and self-determination can now be translated into the opening of small businesses. And then the consciousness of the condition will cause us to gravitate towards investing and supporting those small businesses. And then within one generation, you can begin to witness a complete turnaround. But part of the problem as well is that this kind of dialogue in Trinidad and Tobago society has been considered to be racist simply because it addresses issues of ethnicity. In America right now, with the conclusion of the George Floyd case, we're seeing, because of the aggression of the Black Lives Matter movement, and the standing up for justice and equality within these societies, you're seeing a domino effect all over the world, where even now the top football teams, Manchester United, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, and Tottenham, are taking a knee in not just support of, but in respect for the Black Lives Matter movement. And that respect needs to be replicated in societies such as ours, where the African community is accused of not supporting the harmonious cosmopolitan template of our society simply when we call for justice or speak out for justice. Mm. Uh, David uh, Mohammed, Dr. David Mohammed, uh, you talked about the fact that there is almost seems to be a pipeline uh, leading our young black yep. men in particular straight to the to the to the jails. Um, mm. Let's look at that for a minute because one could almost say that the justice system is basically set up uh, to ensure that we lock them up and throw away the key uh, and yes. basically denying the country all of their potential uh, for development and, and for building up Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, and the whole concept of a school to prison pipeline, which is again one of the sections of the book, is something that again is reoccurring throughout all of these Western societies. And it's part of what we refer to as institutionalized racism, a phrase coined by our own Kwame Toure who we named, of course, our center after, which is also referred to as systemic racism, where racism exists simply because of its presence in multiple different institutions, and its occurrence in each of these institutions strengthens its presence in every other institution. So, for example, within the economy, there is social class distinction and differentiation by ethnicity. There's a tiny ethnic elite white minority within the Caribbean that controls the means and forces of production. But then that is also supported by the educational system, which reinforces myths of white supremacy, black inferiority, refusal to address the glorious history of Africa. How could we have all of these children of African descent 
but none of them be taught in the school system that Africa was the birthplace of humanity where the Garden of Eden was and we were the fathers of mathematics, science, art, music, the first towns, villages, cities, civilizations, schools, colleges, and libraries were all in Africa. And African people wrote the number system and established the alphabet, but not one African child is taught this within the system. So it goes from the economy to the educational system, then through the media, which over sensationalizes black crime and over represents black people as criminals and white people as victims of the crimes that black people commit. And then it goes over into the religion with a false image of a white Jesus, which again reinforces the white supremacy of the education system. Then it recycles over to the law where you see in the prison system now, according to Dr. Darius Figuera, there are no African drug lords on the top level, not even one. All of the drug lords in the Caribbean are of other ethnicities. But when you go into the prison, as I have had close to 100 visits in the prison, collecting research as well, you see exclusively people of African descent charged for the crimes that have their genesis with others. So it repeats and recycles through each of these agencies and institutions, and then it ends up with the culture. So the young black man who is an entertainer about to write a song, what he writes is now so poisonous and toxic, talking about degradation and disrespect of his own woman, the shooting and killing and stabbing as a form of entertainment on television and in song, because it is a reflection as we ask that cliche question, is it art that imitates life or is it life that imitates Do art? Not. And then it goes right around full circle, coming again through the economy, the negative educational system, the religion, and all of these institutions. So there is a consistent reinforcement of all of these negative cultures that uphold and support each other. But we have to break that cycle through knowledge and consciousness. It's titled Black Youth at Risk from Juvenile Delinquency to Criminal Gang Activity. And it's going to be launched officially at the Kwame Touré Education Center in Laventil on a Saturday, May the 1st. The author, Dr. David Muhammad, uh, author, historian, and a sociologist. And congratulations on this uh, seminal piece of research, uh, Dr. David Muhammad. Oh, thank you so much. And of course, we will uh, keep in touch with you as more issues like these arise to tap into your expertise in this area. Have a great yes, day. Yes, thank you so much. And, and let me just mention, sorry, that the pre-orders are available on our website, www.blackagendaproject.com. Excellent. Congratulations thank you, again. Jessie. Have a great day.